look at good ornamentation and say, how does vegetable collection shape that? We might see what kind of food does herbivore eat and say, how does it um, choose that or try and fend off any toxic chemicals? But in the last couple of decades, we've really learned that we actually need to be looking at organisms like this. As a collection of microbes within their body, and a collection of microbes that they're interacting with in the environment and in their food and other hosts. And we've learned that microbes contribute a lot to phenotypic and genotypic differences this way, and we're just now starting to realize that those microbes might also have some uh, some skin in the game with these interactions. So we first kind of looked at these obligate microbes. So here in this here, there's this um, symbiont um, that's not anywhere else in this picture. It's a deer specific symbiont. And we call those obligate symbionts. And we tend to think that those are pretty um, aligned in terms of fitness interests with their host, although that may or may not be true. Um, but I think more interestingly, with the the um, interest in the microbiome, we found that a lot of these um, micro host specific microbes actually come from the environment. Um, so you can see there's this blue, baby looking microbe in here, but it's also found in the soil. And these have a lot more of a dynamic evolution. So you can see host to environment and back and forth transmission, um, meaning that it's unclear if those microbes are selected to be in a host or if they're selected to in the environment. It's unclear if there's any coevolution going on between different hosts and microbes, and they seem to be especially context dependent. So sometimes they're good for our host, sometimes they're bad for our host. Um, and I'd like to make the argument that we really need to think about what kind of uh, benefit or fitness consequences there are for the symbionts and the microbes to understand what these uh, host microbe interactions look like. So typically when we find, find out that, surprise, an organism has a bunch of microbes in it, we do an experiment where we can kind of place it on this continuum um, as either a mutualist or a beneficial microbe or a uh, parasitic microbe. And we know that this can depend on context. So here is a rhizobial with you interaction, and we know that if there's fertilizer or other nutrients added to the environment that uh, this kind of interaction can change, and that can also change with evolutionary dynamics as well. But I think we really need to think of this not as a continuum, but as a four by four matrix, where we also think about the symbiont fitness. So it's not just the host in this interaction. Um, there's a whole bunch of other microbes that could benefit and keep this as kind of a mutualism, or they could be pathogenic or some other um, interaction. So generally, we kind of think of the evolutionary uh, dynamics or motivators of host microbe interactions being mutualistic, and they are reinforced by things like partner choice or policing of sanctions or fitness feedback to be a partner. And those are kind of our default evolutionary hypotheses when we see a host microbe interaction. But I think if we look at symbiotic we really could span this whole matrix here, and we don't really have a lot of good idea of evolutionary mechanisms that can keep partners together down here. Um, although here with pathogens, we have a better idea. Now there's the name. So um, parasites we know a little bit about, but we haven't even thought much about here where we can have hosts that are enslaving or imprisoning symbionts, or hosts of microbes that are competing for food or resources. So I mentioned before, um, when you find a host that has a symbiont or a microbiome, you do this typical sort of canonical experiment where you measure uh, host fitness, usually to some measure of reproduction with and without microbes. And if it's mutualistic, it probably turns out something like this, where reproduction is higher with symbionts and lower without symbionts. I'd like to argue with faculty of symbionts, you can do basically the same experiment and measure um, the fitness of the symbiont with the host and without, um, because many of these symbionts are easily grown, well, maybe not easily, but possibly grown without their host. And if you see a mutualistic interaction, you might see something similar to what we saw before, where you get more reproduction with the host than without a host. But we also know that context dependency matters. 
So I think you can't just pick one sort of environment or treatment to do this in. We have to think about all the different things my folks are doing in, in the host community environment in this picture. So those are things like dispersal, transmission, um, size, possible um, DNA transfer um, possibilities, and also community dynamics. So today I'm going to talk to you about some measurements I've done of symbiont growth and also measurements of dispersal and competitive interactions within the soil. So first I need to tell you about my system. It's not a new system, but it's a relatively new system for the microbiome world. That's ichthyosterium, dysphorium, a social microbe, or cellular slime mold. It's typically um, seen in these unicellular amoebas going around eating up bacteria. And as they eat up all their bacteria, they go into a starvation social state where they aggregate together and form a multicellular structure that can either move as a slug. So this is a slug that is protoplastic and moves toward life and basically to be dispersed. And it will eventually form into this um, stationary fruiting body that's dispersed by invertebrates or other um, active vectors. And so that's what this looks like up here in these sort of human acidic soils. Um, you can see these fruiting body structures. And because I think this is a really charismatic microfauna, I'd like to show you what that looks like um, in set up time. So this is over about two days of development. When it starts, it's, it'll be just amoebas, but you won't be able to see them. And there'll be a lot of action right here at the corner. And you'll be able to see them moving through their slug stage, um, forming aggregations and getting into their fruiting body stage. This happens to about over two days. Um, so it's pretty um, charismatic. And you can imagine a lot of dispersal migration going on, so that's definitely something we want to look at with symbionts. So what microbe is this thing carrying around with it? Well, one, it's bacteria, so it eats up a lot of bacteria. But generally, that bacteria, the absence of it, is what triggers that social cycle and migration. So that's typically gone and totally digested by the beginning of the social cycle. That doesn't play much of a role in the rest of its development. Um, the, our labs have found that there's also um, a specific symbiont called Berkeleyaria, which gives Dictyostelium um, the ability to carry this food bacteria around with it through its social cycle. So Berkeleyaria isn't itself edible, but it prevents Dictyostelium from digesting all of its food, and it basically can help Dicty bring some snacks along with it throughout its development. So this is what that looks like in micrograph form. Um, we have amoebas on top here, and these are the spores that are the fruiting body structure. Red is purple area, and green is food bacteria. So you can see it's both packaged intracellularly um, in a co-infection sort of pattern, and also extracellularly in the sort of new extracellular matrix that forms um, when these guys get together as a multicellular aggregate. So the way that Dictyostelium benefits from the area is, like I said, it allows it to bring some snacks along with it. So in case it lands up in a bad environment, it will still have some food. This is what that looks like without Berkeleyaria. So here, food bacteria is basically red, because amoeba is happily eating all this bacteria up until it's gone. It goes through its social cycle to form a fruiting body. And then these spores disperse, disperse and hatch in a new environment. And when there's no food around, they basically will try to go through a social cycle, but will probably die and have very little to eat. When this blue virtual area is around, um, it allows um, the amoebas to eat up most of the food, but not all of it. The virtual area and the food are co-packaged in these sori or the top of the fruiting body. And when the amoebas disperse and hatch, they basically have a little food party um, where they can eat all the food they brought themselves and take nothing with around. So the data for that looks like this. In these food scarce environments with Berkeleyaria and the light gray bar, um, 
We don't need to do all right, but basically are dead without birth variants. However, if these amigos land in the food rich environment after dispersal, then Berkovaria is actually hot safe. Um, they do totally better with unrolled patients um, when there's more food around, which is not surprising, but they're a little bit of a suppression fit with the Berkovaria. There's also a lot of variation in the Berkovaria, so we know we have three species and there's a lot of string variation within that, especially within the top species. So we have a Bricolaris um, and Paleoa. A Bricolaris tends to be really beneficial, so it gives a really good benefit when food is scarce and it's not that costly when the food uh, is available. Uh, B. Paleoa is the exact opposite. It doesn't give that much of a benefit, and it's pretty costly when food is available. There's also a third one that's similar to Paleoa, but I'm not going to talk about it. So from what we know so far with the system, we can go back to this quad matrix and kind of trace our origins here just based on what we know from co-sickness. So in food scarce environments, uh, the, the blue is Bricolaris, so these will be the colors throughout the red. That's pretty good, um, high up there on the fitness spectrum. Paleo, not that great, but it's still better than nothing. In food rich, both of these um, symbiotes are costly. Um, but it seems to be worth it to keep it around because we don't know what kind of environment we're going to disperse it. So I think this is a really good system to test symbiote fitness because we can grow the symbiote separately from the host, we can mix and match them, and we can use soil in the lab in these semi natural environments. So I use this to look at three different questions, or three different measures of fitness. One is just the most basic thing you can think of, basically reproduction or uh, symbiont population size and their growth rate. The second is looking at their composition with other microbes in the soil to see how the host can catch that. And the third is dispersal. So first up for abundance or population size, I did a pretty simple experiment in these soil microcosms. So this is sterilized soil. There's nothing in it. So I put one of these two treatments in it. These are Berkelberia that's alone and basically um, independent food on its own, or Berkelberia that is already packaged in a epithelium amoeba, and I did some adjustments to make sure that the number of Berkelberia were the same between these two treatments. And I picked time frames that covered the whole development life cycle of ichthyostelia. So um, here's the, the amoeba stage, the aggregation, um, they're beginning small fruiting bodies and then mature uh, kind of deteriorating fruiting bodies. And here's what the data looks like for that. So on the x-axis are those time points I just showed you. Here is the log um, copy number or basically for the cell number of virtual area and the two species. The beneficial one and the less beneficial one. The blue is the symbiont alone in the soil. Orange is the symbiont with the host and you can see for this um, symbiont of the Polaris is not much different whether it's in the soil by itself or it has a host with it. There's very little effect of the host. But for P. paleoa, almost immediately after 24 hours, the free living cell uh, goes to a higher population when um, there's no host around, suggesting that this symbiont, which is the one that's not that great, um, can gain some sort of benefit from the host. Um, I also looked at growth rate, and this was a similar set of treatments, so either virtual area alone or virtual area with um, uninfected ichthyostelium, and that's uninfected just because we didn't want to add extra virtual area to the liquid media or to confound a host or symbiont effect. Um, and we measured both of those. Um, maximum specific growth rate is sort of this derivation of uh, doubling time. So here you can see the colors are the same. When Berkelberia is by itself, it has a much faster growth rate, and it's suppressed for both species when the host is around. So that brings us to question. The second species, B. haleyella, benefited from a higher abundance or a larger population size, but the growth rate was suppressed by the host. How does that make any sense? Here's uh, just my theory on what could be going on. 
So these are micrographs again of about 50 of helium spores, either with Theodore Solaris here or BJ Leal here on the right. Um, you can see here these are kind of well controlled. They're not in all the spores. They only take up a little bit of the spore. There's not too much outside of the host. Whereas Paleola is kind of all over the place. It's taking over the cells it's in. It's outside of other cells. Um, and it's quite abundant. So I think what could be happening here is maybe initially it's hard for the drug there to get in the host or it's suppressed, but once it gets in there, it can kind of escape host control and get out into the spores or really just proliferate within the spores. So that's in a food scarce environment. We didn't add anything to that. And then let's just shift to thinking about how the broken barrier deals with all these other bacteria around because its host is a vectorous amoeba. So I did an experiment to see if the host could make broken barrier more competitive or basically rescue it from the effects of other bacteria to bacteria competition. So I used a slightly more complicated treatment in this case. Again, I have the Burkleraria alone. Um, and then here I just have one of the food bacteria and had a Burkleraria plus food treatment. And then I also added the host to the last treatment. And this is the experiment when Burkleraria was rare. So it was about 5% of the total bacterial population. When it's by itself, it grows really well, as expected. When a food competitor bacteria is added, it's suppressed quite a bit. But you can see when dictyostelium is then added, it kind of rescues that. Um, and it doesn't bring its vertical berry back up to its um, original population size, but it does do a lot better than when it's just with its food. I did this at another um, frequency, so this is a 50-50. Uh, for vertical area, it's more common, but it's the same treatment. And you can see these two are similar. Vertical area does great by itself. It's suppressed when the food bacteria is around. But when dictyostelium is added, it kind of can have a large range of effects. It's not so, um, so good at rescuing vertical area. So I thought a lot about this, and I think either one of two things could happen. Either dicty is eating up all the food, the work of area can have the soil to itself. Um, and it can't, it can't do that as much. Um, it, I mean, it can only eat so much food here and then the food is gone. Or it's taking up work of area to be its environment, basically giving it a protected environment to live and replicate it. Or it could be some sort of a combination of both. Um, so I'd like to shift a little bit again and talk about dispersal now. So we know from, um, if you see the high cycle and all of its side phases, it's basically no immediate dispersal. It has this active dispersal phase when it's a slug and it makes it move around in the soil, and it has this passive dispersal phase where it's looking for a vector to move it around um, further, uh, further length from where it starts at. So we looked at both of these separately. Today I'm only going to talk to you about the active dispersal experiments we've done and vector dispersal. Um, I'm going in the lab, much to my lab mate's chagrin, we have a bunch of these huge um, hard copper outside that are loud and they're a little small. So to do this active dispersal uh, experiment, we used a modified cross-hydro mobility assay where we got uh, some antibiotic discs that we used to inoculate um, one of these treatments in. And then because the slug and dicky are phototactic, we covered this with tin foil and just let in a tin full of light so the slug would move towards that um, end of the plate. We checked, it doesn't seem to have any different dispersal area alone if it's in the dark or in the bright sunshine, it seems to grow around the same. And again, these are those same three treatments from the last experiment where vertical area is either alone, with food, or with food, and the host. So this is what those assays look like. This is the vertical area and food alone. This is with some dictyostelium. And because we have multiple bacteria here, we made them fluorescent so we can know which is which and make sure we are measuring the distance that vertical area dispersed instead of the skinny bacteria. Um, 
So the kind of hard to see because green is so bright, but these red streaks are birth area and red is here too. So we use these assays to measure the minimum and the maximum distance that birth area could disperse. So here we have the two different birth area species, red and blue. Uh, this is why they have to be inoculated and we saw Birth area by itself can recruit neither of them got very far by themselves. But when we looked at the host, we saw an interesting pattern. For a Curricularis, they definitely got further, much, much further than they could on our own. But Paleo was kind of a mixed bag. Some did really well, and some didn't get very far at all. So we see a lot of variation there. We also let this assay go for nine days, and we saw a very similar effect just more extreme. So um, we thought maybe if we let them go over the longer birth areas, the cells can get far to get over time. But no, we stayed at pretty much the same um, level. The Adrecolaris continued to travel quite far. And again, with paleo, we saw just a huge variation. Now, some would get very far, and some wouldn't. And it might be um, clone specific, it might just be environment or random specific sort of thing. We're still looking into that, but we can tell for now that the Agricolaris combined definitely benefits paleo more from its bag. So we also took some pictures of this um, a little bit more close up to see what was going on. So here is one of the slugs, and they slough off all these cells and leave slug trails behind them. So here, sitting by it was one of those slug trails of another slug that had gone by. You can see it's just totally red. Berkeley area are just being smeared all over the environment and not just going to the final destination where the amoeba turns into a fruiting body, but following along with the slug trail as well. And you can see that's really different from this food bag trail. There's only a couple of plots of green every once in a while with some leftover food. Here's a closer up image of that. So here is the slug little part. Here's the slug body, and there's that trail that's leaving behind. So we are seeing that that trail is being left, but there's still tons of bacteria in the slug. This was after about five days, I think. So it can both leave bacteria all over the place, and it keeps a lot within it um, to keep going on to be that final fruiting body. So let's have a summary of what we found here. Basically, as most uh, mutual disease stuff is, the answer is it's complicated and also it depends. So with the semi-abundance and growth, we saw that B. Haleola can definitely benefit in terms of abundance and population size, but B. Agricolaris, we didn't see a benefit for at all. We tested Agricolaris for the competitive ability when we went out of those and it can benefit, but it doesn't always, depending on who else is in the soil with it. And finally, looking at dispersal, Agricolaris definitely benefits, but this time, B. haleola is more of a mixed bag. So let's go back to our slide matrix here. This is where we started out with when we had just measured host fitness. This is under a food scarce environment. We knew the host benefited, so it's very tempting to say, well, this is a mutualism. But once we did those growth rate experiments in a food scarce environment, we saw these interactions go like this, where one was benefiting and one wasn't. When I did this competition or this um, growth rate experiment with competitors present, I just did that with the Agricolaris um, This is what the host fitness led us to believe um, that this interaction was happening. When we looked at the symbiont fitness as well, we saw when the symbiont was rare, yeah, it was pretty beneficial, but when it was not rare, it was a little bit detrimental, just sort of okay. And finally, with dispersal, we haven't measured the symbiont um, effect on the host or dispersal, so I'm just going to put this on the, the symbiont axis, but we found that one benefited a lot and the other was just sort of meh. Um, but this picture looks a lot different than the picture we started with, where we had sometimes this, this mutualism or interaction uh, is good and sometimes it's costly. Here, we now have an interaction that spans all of these different categories, and I don't think that starting with the base hypothesis of this might be 
post sanctions or this might be purifying selection or arms race selection is going to be very useful. So I just want to make the case that nothing else from this talk that um, we probably should think a little wider and all incorporate symbiosis into that kind of thinking when we're thinking about evolutionary mechanisms that could be um, allowing these sort of micro interactions to persist. So just a quick summary of the conclusions. Um, once I started measuring symbiotic that doesn't really change the idea of what this interaction or host micro relationship was. Um, we saw that they can stay together um, under scenarios other than strict mutualism where both partners are getting a benefit of their most situations. And also these symbionts, we did see one benefit for uh, population size or direct reproductive fitness, but we also saw different kinds of benefits which could uh, reinforce this interaction in different ways. And I just like to start thinking of how can we incorporate these sorts of ideas into our evolutionary models and thinking for both micro interactions. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank a bunch of people. Um, Tyler and James here did some of the work for the experiments in this. Uh, project and my two undergrads, Obi and Lloyd, are in charge of wrangling the flies and do so with a happy heart. And I'd like to thank the rest of the Solar Strauss Lab and Jeremy Yoder for organizing a session that includes a lot of women, a lot of junior researchers, um, and a lot of really cool clients. And also, just a little advertisement out there I'm starting a new job at New Mexico Highland University in the fall, and I'm looking for. Uh, master's students. So if you're an undergrad or you know a smart undergrad, come to send me an email. And now I'll take any questions.